I'm, I'm really appreciative to Sharon and Sarah for letting me kick off this symposium that the CTSI, which is one of the most pivotal new initiatives in understanding how we realize the benefit of translational research uh, going forward. And it's an incredible honor for me to be receiving an award named for Gus Watanabe. When I started uh, as a house officer and resident, he was one of the legendary chairs of medicine in America uh, at Indiana University. And it was shocking when I was a first year assistant professor that he chose to leave this uh, august position running the largest medical school in America to go over to Eli Lilly to work on drug discovery. But he proved that translational research, bench to bedside research, makes a difference and developed, helped to really develop 11 meaningful medicines across the whole care spectrum of disease over his decade that he led as the scientific director of Lilly. Um, and so he was one of the pioneers of what we now know of as translational medicine. Um, translational medicine means a lot to a lot of people, and this is a very broad uh, caregiving community that serves the entire state of Indiana. You have hospitals distributed. There are people listening from all over the state. Um, and more and more, translational research has turned into observations on the bedside that we have the scientific tools to study disease in human beings. And so more and more translational research is all about observing problems at the bedside, things we explain to patients we don't really understand as caregivers, and taking them back to the research lab to learn new things about how disease works. So I'm gonna tell you a story about that starting for the students and the fellows. So this is just a story that started long before most of the students and fellows were born when I started training, when I was a fellow trying to figure out how as a physician can we get better medicines to deliver to our patients. And uh, the disease I took care of was, or cared about the most, even starting as an intern and resident was cancer. So I'm gonna tell you a cancer story. But today in the CTSI, you just heard about the vision statement and what's delivered here by Sharon and Sarah as the leaders of the CTSI, which is distributed throughout the state, is we've actually got to serve the population. And nobody wants to get sick and need, need my care. I'm a bone marrow transplanter by clinical transplantation. Nobody wants to be my, me to be their doctor. Nobody chooses me. You have a disease and you come for that expertise. Um, and so what we'd really like to do is have prevention strategies. What we really like to have is treatment strategies when it's simple to correct this problem, understand the pathogenesis of the disease. And that's what the rest of this day is all about. So I'm the first hour just to wake you all up, okay? There's some terrific young faculty here that are gonna talk about their ideas as part of the CTSI supported that have won awards from your own group. And they're gonna talk this afternoon. I had a delightful lunch with them. Uh, yesterday to hear the amazing stuff. I actually changed my talk so I could prove I was still as an old guy trying to do what they're doing, but they're doing it much better. So I'm gonna just tell you a story and it's in honor of Dr. Watanabe and it's also for the fellows and residents because I didn't have a clue how these great physicians who taught me when I was in medical school and when I was a house officer, who are the experts of their time in this field, actually figured out the stuff they were known for. How do you pick what you're gonna do for research? So I'm gonna tell you that story. Uh, if it seems too old, I apologize. If it seems like you know part of it and I don't tell you the whole story, they don't give me enough time, okay? So um, my slides should be up here. Uh, this is CME to know that I have complications around your thinking I'm an honest broker of scientific information. Okay, I work for a place called Memorial Sloan Kettering. We're the oldest cancer standing, it's freestanding and independent of government support in the world. We've been there for 138 years and we aren't going anywhere because cancer is still an important problem. Okay, so I care about, that as an institution, I care about what it means for cancer patients. Uh, I get funding research from all the various things, from philanthropic groups, from everything else. There's a list of them in the last three or four years for us. I care like Dr. Watanabe about translating that in a way it can be delivered to a broader population. So I work with pharmaceutical and biotech companies. Two right now that are relevant. I am on the board of directors of Regeneron and I'm on the board of directors of a, of a CRO service company, which you know is Charles River. You probably buy some mice from them. Not an advertiser to buy from. There's lots of other good companies now that make it, so don't do that. But it teaches me what our industry has to do to ultimately deliver this to patients. 
And I started a company, and that's relevant to this talk. I started a company with Luke Cantley at Harvard and Tack Mac at the University of Toronto to think about cancer metabolism, metabolism in a new way to build new drugs. And I'm going to tell you that story at the end. And I got to have full disclosure. I'm going to tell you about one of the drugs that's FDA approved for the treatment of leukemia and why we're using it as a preventative now at the very end. That is not FDA approved. I am not telling you to do this. I'm going to tell you about trial that's ongoing at Washington University in a Memorial Sloan Kettering. I am not involved in that and I no longer have any participation with IGS Pharmaceuticals, but I will tell you some of the things we did when we got the company started to get it on its feet. So that's the disclosure. Um, these are the people that have contributed. Sorry, I don't have time to go through them, but I won't get to tell you the story. Um, it started with the pioneers, many of whom you know, about the idea of what immunology does in cancer. It started because I got to know a guy named Carl June, who was the second recipient of this award when we were both first year fellows at Fred Hutchinson's Cancer Center in Seattle. And Don Thomas picked us to run a clinical trial, be the fellows that oversaw this clinical trial, recorded all the data. And I'm gonna tell you that story, okay? Uh, we were assisted by a whole lot of really good scientists, both in pharma and fact, their list is here from Peter Lindsley and Jeff Ledbetter to Jim Allison and many of the things that you know about as part of this story. Um, I'm going to transit to why we do cancer metabolism. It's one continuous story, but it doesn't make any sense unless you tell it this way. And these are the people that have left that have contributed to that. There's one person in this audience that was part and central to this, and he's your cancer center director, Kelvin Lee. I'm going to embarrass him because this story starts when he didn't know anything about the laboratory. He was a great fellow clinically, and we had to teach him molecular biology. And the project we taught him on transformed how we think about immuno-oncology because he accomplished it. So, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Okay, so when I started, bone marrow transplantation was saving lives. There were three or four places, Memorial Sloan Kettering, the Fred Hutch in Seattle, who could do this effectively in the late 1970s, and people who had no other hope of diet and were dying of leukemia, usually young kids with ALL that had gone through five rounds of curative chemotherapy, or adults with AML would die. And we were doing the studies to prove that, graft versus, uh, that um, bone marrow transplantation could lead to a cure. And Don Thomas and his colleagues, before I even joined, had shown in the first 100 patients that received bone marrow transplant that meaningful cures could be delivered. But there were horrible side effects. To this day, the most devastating side effect for patient care is graft versus host disease. Now, there's some equity issues that people are struggling with right now, and I'm really proud of what we've done at Memorial Sloan Kettering to solve that. Every, today, everyone in the country can get a matched donor because one of the most effective ways to deliver bone marrow transplantation is from cord blood that are saved and done by blood banks, like the New York Blood Center around there. So everybody used to be that only people that had the right HLA type and would really had a, were part of a socioeconomic group that donated in that way or had a large enough family could do that. That's not true anymore. So that was one of the biggest barriers. And now it's reimbursed because of its effectiveness going forward. But the biggest medical complication is graft versus host disease. And this is a picture even today of the systemic problems. And I'm not going to go through any of this. The clinicians here that are in hematology can tell you about that. The manifestation of the skin disease and the weeping lesions that patients get as their uh, new immune system that's developing from the transplanted marrow attacks their skin. But this is just a harbinger of what's going on in their liver and in their intestinal tract and in their kidneys that is destroying their body. And if you don't nip it in the tuck, you don't you get none of the benefits of the bone marrow transplant in terms of curative therapy for their leukemia. And it's still the major complication. And when I came there for the students, there were no good immunosuppressive. There were no treatments to prevent this disease. So the prevention's the key for today. There were none. And when I came to be a first year fellow, Don Thomas turned to Carl June and I and said, we want you to run this clinical trial for this drug called cyclosporin A. Just been discovered in Europe by pharmaceutical company, traditional drug discovery. It's this amazing, immunologists are saying this, it's amazing immunosuppressant. It completely turns off this cytokine we've just discovered called IL-2, which is the mediator of how T cells grow and divide and perpetuate autoimmune disease. So we're gonna try it. Discovered as an extract um, in the way traditional medicines were found at the time, we were lucky enough to give the first 100 patients that got a bone marrow transplant cyclosporin A. 
it was for someone early in their clinical training, nothing short of a miracle. Before that, we gave methotrexate, which is a chemotherapeutic agent. People's mouths would fall off. They would get horrible side effects from the treatment. We got to, do, uh, to prevent the more horrible side effect. And it had a really great medical rationale. This is what not be a rationale. Stop making IL-2. T cells can't do their job. This will work. This is great. And so this is the paradigm down here. T cells get activated by engine presenting cells through their T cell receptor. They have to make IL-2 to clonally expand. That's why our lymph nodes get up when we get an infection. And that amplification leads to all the complications if the cell is autoreactive. Okay, so, we, and again, because of the MHA mix match and bone marrow transplant, that could happen and we never understood. We still to this day don't fully understand all the rules. So we're gonna try this drug. So this is the standard academic slide that happens if you're, that drives fellows and residents crazy. Okay, because I just told you that 100 patients, it was a miracle. I won't tell, I won't belabor it because I want to get through a lot here. But it went night and day from how sick patients were from the suppression of graft versus host disease by taking cyclosporin A. The only hard thing for the people that are interested in biochemistry is that cyclosporin A is lipophilic. And so learning how to titrate the drug when it was saturating into your fat stores uh, was incredibly difficult. Every day, every 12 hours, we had to measure the level. No one could quite agree what the level was. Was it the bound level or the unbound level? All kinds of interesting pharmacology was going on, but the end result is patients were so much better. Their first 100 days, which they spent in Seattle, were a delight to care for them because they didn't get a lot of autoimmune complications. Um, and that was great because our care, our care responsibility as fellows was the first 30 days in the hospital and they didn't get very sick, but we had a nightmare. So the attendings all did the thing in the back. This is a dramatically effective drug. This is mechanism-based. This is fantastic. If you're the fellow responsible for the rest of the care of this patient, it's a disaster because their immune system doesn't work. And the one thing we all knew by that point in our fellowship is that the minute they get out the outpatient, because they stayed for two months in an apartment building together, and their kids that were part of their family members, part of probably the kids of their donor, um, were actually out in the school system. And they were getting all the viruses and all the bacteria that you know your kids get. And they were gonna get an infection and their immune system didn't work. And we had, at the same time this was going on, the AIDS epidemic. So we knew T cells were important. And we were shutting off their ability to work. And we figured out that the first time they got a virus, it was gonna be a disaster in the clinic. And I had the really lucky break of being the first fellow, where there was one fellow in this program that had to take care of all the outpatient bone marrow transplants for two months. They were there for the next two months of their life. And it was the easiest month of my fellowship. Nobody got sick. All the things we worry about, which made the outpatient rotation the biggest headache as a fellow to deal with all the colds and concerns and everything else with the patient, 80% of them went away. And it then became the easiest rotation for the rest of my time, about three years in fellowship. And that didn't make any sense because what the immunologists in the lab said to us is that in fact, this completely blocks IL-2. So at the end of doing the clinical care, Carl June and I said, we have a project, we don't understand this. And the immunologist can't be right because our patients say, this isn't just turning off the ability of T cells to proliferate. We, at the time, because everybody was trying to find new cytokines, it was known IL-2 was the second one, right? So there has to be some others. So we launched, as we started our research year in fellowship, a little side project we did on our own. Not with any blessing from any of the attendees. We bought everything that everybody talked about that was a mitogen for T cells. And we put it in a tube, we added cyclosporin A because we learned how to titrate it during our clinical care. And took us four years. It wasn't our major project, but this result came out in 1987, okay? We found a combination of stimulatory antibodies for T cells that did not care about cyclosporin A. Purely lab test using each other's blood and, and technicians in the lab's blood to test this and do classic assays. The cool assay at the time was to cross-link things with the T cell receptor, anti-CD3, this is the classic immunologist experiment, activate the T cell receptor, and then add in cyclosporin A in a dose-dependent fashion, completely suppress the immune response, as the immunologist said, they're right, even in humans. It wasn't just mice, it was humans, that works, and that's why the patients were responding so well. 
But if we stimulate it with this weird combination of a four ball ester and anti-CD28, cells proliferated just fine and they did not care at all whether you added cyclosport A. And that's why, at least to this day, we believe, I don't know they didn't even prove it, that that's the pathway by which you can still mount an immune response if you care enough. There are alternative pathways to activate T cells. And the four ball ester is all you need from the T cell receptor. Okay? So that's all I've been doing for the last 45 years. And I'm getting honored with this prize, so somebody must have paid attention. Okay? So I'm going to try and tell very quickly the story of CD28. So at the time, immunologists, we were all influenced by the Cold War. So in fact, we understood how important the immune system because it's either autoimmunity or lack of immune response that we have struggled with as physicians, okay? And so the immune system has got to get going, but it's got to know that it's right. So the T cell receptor is the initiating key. It initiates the recognition of something foreign that shouldn't be there. But that could be just it's in a new environment and the body's repairing something and it's seeing something it's never seen before, or it could be that this is something really dangerous. And so the idea in immunology, there must be a second signal. It's like those movies, those nuclear disaster movies that were coming out at the time when you wanted to arm the nuclear warhead, two people had to put a key in at the same time and turn it coordinately, and then suddenly it was armed and somebody could push the button. And the immune system does exactly that. It needs two signals. The T cell receptor to know it's right and what it can do, and another signal from the other rest of the immune system that it's really, we need you now, okay? And that signal called signal two turned out to be CD28, this molecule that we discovered from a collection of monoclonal antibodies that was discovered on the first naming thing for monoclonal antibodies in the late 1970s. And it went from what actually happens when you cross link the T cell of a normal T cell when nothing bad's going on, most of the cells die. They die by apoptosis, people like Jay, worked on that. Really important field at the time. Still an important field, I'm not trying to say it isn't, but, <laughs> but we were all trying to figure out what, how this regulated. That's how you delete cells so they aren't autoreactive, is that the T cell receptor engaged in alone actually deletes those cells from your repertoire so you don't get autoimmunity, and autoimmunity comes from the failure of that. But on the other side, if you get two signals, the rest of the innate immune system says, yeah, you're right, we think there's something wrong here. You're off to the races, and what T cells have to do first is clonally expand and proliferate. They have to make more, so they have an army that you can send to this virus infection as we just experienced with COVID. Sometimes we send too big an army and we get cytokine storm, but you need to do it. And then you need to know, figure out how to control and regulate it. And that's been a major focus of immunology research the last 35, 40 years. We didn't discover a new cytokine. So we asked, why can these cells proliferate? It was known T cells needed cytokines to clonally amplify. And much to our chagrin, as we learned molecular biology, they just made buckets more IL-2. And it's an autocrine growth factor for the immune system. So when you just cross-link the T cells in human beings and their peripheral blood, a few of the memory cells will actually make a little bit of IL-2. And that's the signal you see here on this northern blot, when you just cross-link the T cell receptor, but you act both keys at the same time, and they know what they're supposed to do and they're gonna take control. And they make buckets. Actually, this production was the first time we did anything. This is more production than they could get from cost cells in the pharmaceutical industry. Our own T cells were better than the engineering of the time, even to this day, they make more. But they needed this co-stimulatory signal. And we made a proof of principle. At the time, for the fellows, the way you measured lymphocyte proliferation is you put a mitogen, all these molecules that were at being activated of things like um, some of the lectins like concannabinol A, and you study proliferation by adding tritiated thymidine, and if a cell incorporated tritiated thymidine, that made it, it was making DNA. But if you actually looked in your culture, what was happening is 90% of the cells were dying, and a few cells were still alive, and they were trying to keep their DNA going. And we were practical people taking care of patients in the clinic. We knew they needed more T cells to mount a response because of the HIV epidemic. So we took a demonstration project because we didn't think anybody would pay attention to us to actually say, you don't have to count T cells, you need to learn how to make more of them. So this is the demonstration project we did in 1992. Carl figured out how to take and put on a bead the two antibodies, the one for CD3 and CD28, so we could activate every T cell. And then we took from normal volunteers, that means technicians and fellows in the lab, um, 
10 mils of blood, okay? And from that, we isolated by negative selection the CD4 T cells, 5 million of them. For those of you that worked in a lab, that's just enough cells to see at the bottom. And then we added, put, added these beads to them and we gave them culture media. And we just saw what happened. Just so you understand, the 5 million we get from that tube of blood is just enough cells, 5 million to see the number of cells. 50 days later, this is the number of cells that were present in the culture. Now this is done by dilution, so we don't keep all of them, but it's an extrapolation if we kept all of them. This is 100 kilograms of T cells. This is more mass than any one of you walked into this room with. These are the best proliferating cells. Forget cancer cells. These are the best proliferating cells when fully on and fully armed. They go for it. And so this is the signal that allows our immune system to amplify. And that's pretty exciting. This growth process, when we published it, became the standard of the field by every cell therapy that you've seen involving T cells for gene therapy, for CAR T cells. It is the backbone now of the entire field. So I'm telling you about it because otherwise you wouldn't know that there was one day and one time when Carl June and I sat in a room with our hands and did these experiments, okay? We're incredibly proud of that because it's used worldwide, okay? We wanted to understand that, and that's what we've spent the rest of our careers doing. Carl to generate CAR T cells, it was the second recipient of this prize, and I wasn't smart enough to get to the engineering, so I'm gonna tell you some of the other stories. So this is Carl's half of it. It really works. He reduced it to practice. We actually ran a little biotech company which provided all the intellectual property for why we have CAR T cells right now. Um, this is a phoresis product if you've ever been to your blood bank. So we phoresis for platelets and white blood cells and other things at the time. And this is the product out here on the right. It's red because it still contaminates tons of platelets and uh, this is the white cell cut of a plasma phoresis. And then you put it in to a closed culture system that Carl designed where you add these beads. It's a fixed system so it's never opened again. They're fed new nutrients through the system through these, these flow bags. And two weeks later, that's what you get out. You can do this reproducibly at every person in this room. It's totally equitable, it costs a lot, but it's totally equitable, okay? And you get real white blood cells. That's why we call them white blood cells. That's what 10 of the 10th of them look like. And that's base therapeutic for all T cell therapies to this day. We wanted to understand how it worked. And at the time we were working with a small biotech in Seattle and they discovered what the ligand of CD28 was. It's a molecule called CD80 or CD86 or B71 or B72. And now we had a tool to work with. And so we could start to ask that. Brian Seed at Harvard took the antibody we'd worked with and cloned by expression cloning the CD28 gene and we know what it looked like. And this guy, Kelvin Lee, who's sitting right here on the third floor, guy came to the lab at this point and said, I'd sort of like to work on this. This is sort of interesting. And we said, well, you don't know molecular biology yet. So what we are gonna do is we've got this cDNA for this gene. You're gonna tell us what the gene looks like and what regulates it by isolating the gene, characterizing its structure, its promoter, its enhancer, and its, its various exons and introns. And so it's a straightforward molecular biology cloning experiment that day, and Kelvin did it, okay? And reported a beautiful paper that describes what the promoter looks like, what the exon structure is. And then my wife, Tulia Linston, who I run the lab with, went to a meeting in Israel to talk about what I just talked about, because it was a worldwide network we collaborate with. And a guy named Pierre Goldstein said, well, you work on helper cells. I work on cytotoxic T cells. And we just discovered with a manaconal antibody and expression cloning a gene that has homology to CTLA-4. Or to CD28, it's called CTLA-4, cytotoxic lymphocyte antigen 4. And we think they might be related because you have this exciting work that this is a co-stimulatory molecule. So we think this might be the cytotoxic T cell. He wasn't right about that, but we went back and we told Kelvin this. We got a probe for that. And Kelvin discovered on his genomic clones a gene right next door with CTLA-4 to CD28. And next thing he learned is it has exactly the same intron and exon structure. So you've got two of these. You do the evolutionary tracing, this duplication happened about 400 million years ago, so it's sort of important. We've been playing with it. There's a family of these genes. 
And it turned out when Peter Lindsley and, and Jeff Ledbetter checked, this, they had exactly the same ligands. And those ligands bound to C to A4 even tenfold better. So we said, this is, the, this is the super switch. And everybody in the field said, well, we get it. This is it. Tulia did these experiments along with Kelvin uh, that are next. Um, oh, so we were asking, what does C to A4 do? So Tulia did these experiments to just look using Kelvin's clones at what the expression of CD28 versus C to A4 did. What, what does this promoter enhancer do? And I'm not going to go through any of the data. This is really ancient. The full paper is there. But we discovered that nobody, not, not cytotoxic cell, not T cells, have C to A4 without being activated. It just doesn't play in the game of the initial response of T cells. The only thing that's there is CD28. I'm not going to go through this for the details of the different stimulators. CD20 is out. And when you fully activate a cell, what happens is C to A4 comes on and CD28 goes off. So that's why the idea in the field was is it's a super enhancer. So we went back and said, what's the best test of that? Well, at the time, people were making model organisms, and so Kelvin was assigned to build a knockout clone for CTLA-4. And he shipped it up to TAC Mac, our colleague up in Toronto, who was the immunologic powerhouse of knocking out mice and, ge and genes in mice and seeing what happened. And about a few months later, Kelvin got a call from his colleague in Toronto. And they said, we figured it out. You have to know Tack. He doesn't like to tell you the answer. He just likes to tell you he figured it out. Um, every single mouse died within the first three weeks of life. And they died because systemically their body became an incubator for T cells. And every tissue, every organ in their body was being destroyed by autoimmune responses. It's the most profound phenotype of the many knockouts we've ever done. And this is highly reproducible. The, at birth, these animals start destroying their organs with autoimmune T cell responses, and it's against every organ. There's no tolerance because there's no negative regulator. And so what we were able to do with Jeff Bluestone and Jim Allison confirming this, C to A4 was a negative regulator. And this was a dramatic in vivo example of that. There are other co-stimulatory molecules, but CTLA-4 in the initial immune response is the most potent negative regulator. And of course, you know that this is an expanded family. Other homologs were found, PD-1 being the one we all have heard about in the last years, because it's the peripheral negative regulator that's most important right now as we see it as a cancer therapeutic. Uh, here's the autoimmune disease. I forgot I put it in the picture. This is the animal. This is the enlargement of its heart. They almost all die of heart attacks and failure. Uh, and so their hearts in line, their liver there. This is an ancient picture that's been published. But these animals were dramatic. You open them up at every organ. Didn't matter what your specialty was, your organ was being destroyed. Uh, and this is just the, the demonstration of that. Tissue culture, you'd see lymphocytes. This is heart muscle. And all of those are neutrophils and lymphocytes orchestrated by CD4, just slowly killing all the myofibrils. So CTI4 is a negative regulator. Um, that's an exciting thing. That means you have a tool to do translational research. So Jim Allison was interested in, in cancer. You all know the story. He won the Nobel Prize for it. You make a blocking anti to CTLA-4 so the off switch can't go on. You get enough cells, and it worked a little bit. And then it turned out you do the same thing with PD-1. It's even better. And that's the largest pharmaceutical in the world right now. We were more interested, Carl and I, in, gee, this is interesting. This is much more avid. So pharmacologically, this extracellular domain of CTLA-4 is a negative regulator. And it binds with more avidity than the, than the CD28 to the ligand. So you can make an artificial molecule by engineering. So it has a long half-life. It has an immunoglobulin tail. And it has an extracellular domain that's CTLA-4. So you've now not made an antibody. You made a thing that has the pharmacologic properties of an antibody. But it actually has the binding properties of CTLA-4. So it'll bind up any ligands and hopefully suppress immune responses. And so. The disease we chose to think about and do models in animals was the most common autoimmune disease because it was clear it was T cell mediated. Anti TNFs had just been discovered. We had colleagues in London um, that were working on anti TNFs, Tiny Manny doing the clinical trials. And we said that's pretty dramatic. We know this regulates TNF activation. So let's see if CTLA4IG works in this disease. 
The animal model said yes. Bristol Myers bought the biotech company that Jeff Ledbetter and Peter Lindsley were doing, and they had the will to do the clinical trials. Um, the drug is ctla 4 ig It's now called Arantia. Um, it was there to inhibit the ability of the antigen presenting cell to give that second signal because of the higher avidity for binding the receptor. And this is Arantia today. It was approved in 2005 for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. It is still the number one backup to TNF. There's still a debate in the rheumatology field. I do not participate in that debate any longer. This appears to be potentially disease modifying, whereas anti-TNF is actually side effect ameliorating. And so it is one of the fastest growing drugs in the rheumatology space, even today in autoimmune space going forward. It's one of the largest selling drugs for BMS. I don't know if that's good or bad, but tens of thousands of people take it and are benefited. And Jim's approved, this is exactly the same in oncology. So this, these are an important receptor family for translational research. What we do in basic science, starting with clinical observations can make a difference. Um, and so again, this is a network. There is a large family. We're learning the rules. You'll hear about other members of the family or related co-stimulatory molecules or inhibitory molecules that are being explored in the immune system. So Carl went off taking this information and said, I can fuse the CD3 tails, the intracellular signaling domains with CD28, along with my, uh, a colleague of mine at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Michelle Satellin. They competed and collaborated to make these CAR T cells. And that was the exciting engineering that could be done new. So you could engineer a cell, have an immunoglobulin receptor, just like the ctla 4 ig so it would recognize an antigen as it does in the lymphoid lineage like CD19. And it has the signaling properties when it's engaged of both the T cell receptor and CD28 fused together or another co-stimulatory molecule. And that is the industry you know, and you've become a world leader in investigating new car therapies and new approaches around that. I was too dumb just for the students at Phil's. I said, that sounds like engineering. I don't really understand why this works. So I'm going to figure that out. And so the last really important experiment Carl and I did together was to actually take gene chips around the turn of the century. Remember when every CTSI was responsible for making the chip so people could do gene expression analyses. We don't do that anymore. We now have next gen sequencing. And we did this experiment, which, which changed what my lab did for the rest of our careers, which is, and it was done in Carl's lab. This is 3,665 genes on a chip that get turned on when you activate the T cell receptor. Pretty amazing, about 10, 15% of all the genes that you have get turned on when you just sort of this switch the T cell receptor. But sometimes it kills you, and sometimes it makes you this incredibly impotent immune regulator. So we wanted to know, there's gonna be some cool signal transduction through CD28, that actually turns on another set of genes that are complementary to make that decision, right? two switches. There are no new genes turned on by CD28. But the full answer we believe, and it's a belief, we're trying to prove it as we go forward, um, we found lots of interesting things I'll talk to you about, is that in fact, everything that's green got turned on, gets greener from here to here. This is CD3 along, this is CD3 plus CD28. Everything's greener. Everything that gets turned off that's red in the CD3 gets redder. Every one of the genes goes into its corner in response to the CD3 better. How do you affect every gene coordinately became the quest of us for the last 20 years, okay? Postdoc in the lab followed. Kelvin did this interesting experiment. We said the only thing we could think of is if you gave more energy to a cell who could do everything better, it would do it more efficiently it would be better at that. So we went and looked at what happens to metabolism. And I'm just gonna show one slide. We discovered, yeah, the T cell turns on, T cell receptor turns on these things, but it doesn't give you the resources to, re, to enact those things. So if cell gets into conflict, that's death. But if you turn on your ability to access the nutrients we share in hopes of preserving you from auto, for, by mounting an immune response, you upregulate the glucose and amino acid transporters. And this is just an experiment like that. Here's a non-specific antibody, the way we used to do facts. Here's an antibody specific to the glucose transporter surface expression on the cell. And you can see T cells have a basal level. When you activate the T cell, it doesn't change at all. If you add CD28, it doesn't change at all. You add the two together, 
and it goes up tenfold. What you need to know for those of you who are not in the field of glucose metabolism, GLUT1, the gene that all cells other than insulin responsive cells, always works at Vmax. So it's just directly proportional to the amount you have on the cell surface. So this tenfold gain gives the cell access to all the resources it needs to build daughters as fast as you can. And in that grow up experiment, I show you the cell cycle time is five to six hours. When you give cells all the resources they need to build the supply chain problem and the information, they go and do their job. And that's what we've been exploiting and trying to understand what that metabolic switch is. You can work on the chemistry. So for the people that say, well, we should actually get some more specificity, it's all regulated through this gene that the insulin field and the oncology field found simultaneously for its road in oncogenesis in human, but also for its critical role in insulin signaling transduction downstream of PI3 kinase is a critical gene, AKT. It controls your ability to take up glucose, capture it by phosphorylation, and commit it to glycolysis. That's what Warburg discovered, aerobic glycolysis in cancer cells. And CTLA-4 negatively affects this because this is serine 3 and kinase, and you dephosphorylate, it's inactive. Doesn't matter what PI3 kinase does. So this is the access of cells that are not professional metabolic cells to nutrients in our body. And this is the T cell regulation. That led us for 10 years in my lab to start the fields of immunometabolism and, and what's called oncometabolism these days, the, the study of where metabolism fits in. We, and many, many people in the field have fleshed out that model I just showed you of how it regulates an amino acid metabolic coordination of mitochondria and glycolysis. I'm not going to bore you with any of those details. We did that. But after a number of years, we started to whine about this. We found all these signaling pathways that had not been understood beyond insulin before that regulated this complex maze we all learned in biochemistry of intermediate metabolism. And lots of oncogenes were implicated in regulating aspects of metabolism, and you can't pick up a journal today to not see that. And it's critical for the immune response based on what I just told you in studies from many other laboratories now. We're a minor part of it. But it is interesting that there were no mutations at the time these, this fact was done and we started thinking about this, 2007, there were no new genes that were metabolic genes that were implicated in the causation of cancer. And I whined about this. The TCAGA project was going on. Everybody was excited about the TCA project and figuring it out. And there were none. There actually are a couple now, but at the time this was done, we finally realized a couple of the oncogenes were, but only in retrospect, and I may mention that at the very end. But in 2008, right after I made this slide, I got a call from a colleague who had been at medical school at the University of Pennsylvania before me. That's how you know things for the students and postdocs. Your friends and colleagues that you know and trust call you up for advice, and you pay attention sometimes. So Bert Vogelstein, I think everybody knows, didn't really believe in the TCAGA project. He believed we could do next-gen sequencing and it would be affordable enough to sequence your whole genome. And then we'd find new oncogenes. And so he was a naysayer and he ran his own shop. He took over a shopping mall in Baltimore. I don't know if you know this. And he did exome sequencing in cancer and discovered a whole bunch of new oncogenes. And one day he called me up in 2008 and he said, what do you know about this gene IDH? And I said, well, it's funny you should ask. I have a new MD, PhD student. We're working on IDH because it's really cool. It's an essential gene that regulates, we believe, the transfer of reducing equivalents from the mitochondria to the cytosol and back to balance our redox status. And so we think it's going to be a really important thing in cancer because the redox problem in cancer and the stress and the Fenton reaction for those that are pharmacologists was an idea. He said, that's what I thought. And he hung up because that's perfect. <laughs> okay. I go, oh, that's sort of interesting. I'll tell Pat that you know there's somebody interested in what you're doing, maybe. Uh, and about six months later, I got a call from Tim Lai, uh, who I'd been a postdoc with, who's at WashU, and he said, "Huh, what do you know about IDH?" And I said, same thing I told him to Bert. And he said, "Gee, Craig, that's great because I just sequenced the second leukemia patient, and we don't know whether it's a passive bystander or not, but in fact, there's an IDH mutation." What do you think about that? And I told him the same thing. It looks like redox. And he said, OK, that's really helpful. We're going to, I'll let you know if we do anything with it. And I went and told Pat this. And then Bert Vogelstein sent a paper with his colleagues at Duke 
that transformed everything. This was present in every case of secondary glioblastoma that existed in the Duke database. Mutations in either IDH1 or IDH2. And I was asked by the New England Journal, because nobody else cared about metabolism and cancer, to write the editorial. And I said, this doesn't make sense. So here's what IDH is. It's not the enzyme you learned about in the Krebs acid cycle, but it's more important. The enzyme you learned in the Krebs acid cycle is not essential for human life. That was discovered right about this time. That gene is called IDH3, but it's the one you learned, Krebs discovered. It's an NADH-linked dehydrogenase in the TCA cycle. And the only reason you need it is to keep from going prematurely blind when you're 60. Otherwise, you're completely normal, as best we can tell. And that was only town when classic genetics was done compared with next-gen sequencing. But there's two other genes that you have that do exactly the same enzymology, but they produce NADPH. That's what Pat was working on. And that was the genes that were mutant in gliomas. And with colleagues, because Memorial is a big, I actually was not at Memorial, I was at the University of Pennsylvania, but with my colleague, Ross Levine, who I knew very well, um, we went to the databases of leukemias and simply said, is this a common thing? And I'll tell you that part of the story. But to make a long story short, we thought it shuttled because these are reversible enzymes, particularly IDH2, and they can go in both directions, and they're regulated, and they produce NADPH, and everything that was found in Bert's paper said only one parental allele is mutated, and it's always a missense mutation, and that missense mutation is always in one of two arginines, the orthologs in either gene. We found a third arginine that was relevant in the leukemia database, and now we knew we had something interesting. You always still had a normal allele. Now, that could be a dominant negative for those people that know, but there was something interesting. And at that time, metabolomics field was just beginning, and so you could do metabolomics. So this was done with our colleagues at Princeton, Josh Rabinowitz, uh, and Agios Pharmaceuticals. You put this new mutation into a cell line. This is just a neural cell line that just adds this gene with the mutation. And you ask for the thousand genes you can measure by mass spec that are metabolites, small organic metabolites, does anything change? A metabolite that's on this 45 degree axis is the same in the wild type cells as the mutant tumor. It's called the tumor signal here, but it's just the addition of this one gene. And you can see there's only three spots that are off the diagonal. And because this is a derivatized mass spec procedure, these are actually all the same metabolite. There's only one metabolite that changes. And that metabolite isn't in normal cells at any meaningful quantity. It was known to be a byproduct of metabolism. That molecule is called 2-hydroxyglutarate. Its accumulation in cancer cells is 10 millimolar. It's the most important metabolite, or the largest by quantity that exists inside the cell of a cancer cell with an IDH mutation. So the field said, oh, this is a cool new biomarker. This will tell us it's a biomarker, but it must be something really interesting this gene does. And we made the mistake, or actually the excited, to call it an oncometabolite when this discovery of the production of 2-HGV, these mutations are done. We got incredible heat from the genetic community. Um, they were through their heat when we discovered the third allele uh, that did this, and it turned out to explain all the kids remain that genetically had 2-hydroxyglutarate. They had that same mutation. It was known that half the kids that had elevated at birth things had de defects in the dehydrogenase that clears these molecules. The remaining had the mutation, the same mutation. So if you get it at birth, you actually have incredible neural development defects. Um, the biochemistry is that IDH works as a dimer. So if you have one mutant and one allele, more often than not, 50% of the dimers are going to be a mutant and a boy. And the wild type allele can do the forward reaction, converting isocitrate to alpha ketoate, removing CO2 and getting any two electrons for NADH. But the mutant, because it lacks those arginines, cannot re-coordinate the addition of CO2. I didn't bore you with the structural biology, it, but it can add the two electrons, and that makes 2-hydroxyglutarate. And it just builds up because it overwhelms the cell's ability to deal with detoxification with things like P450 and dehydrogenases. And it accumulates to 10 millimolar. And we could actually make, we had a chemist make a ton of this. You could transform cells, at least for periods of time, by just adding the metabolite. It truly is an oncometabolite. The great thing for us, I'm a leukemia doctor, as I just told you, 
And we didn't think we need any more genes. We didn't need the geneticists to tell us more genes, and suddenly we had a new gene. And so the great thing about bioinformatics and computational tools is you can do association studies. And so we did an association study. We said, we know all these other drivers of cancer. When do you get IDH? What other do they go along with? Because there's not one gene that just causes leukemia full on. You need combinations. And you can do these kind of matterfragments. This is a circus bot of a database that existed at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Of all the patients that had an IDH one or two mutation, what other genes were mutated that were known to cause cancer in their incidence? And it's every combination except one. We never saw a patient with a TET2 mutation that had just been described in France as a new tumor suppressor at exactly the same time. And we did the reverse because they discovered this is a tumor suppressor. If you've lost TET2, what other things are co-associated in the leukemia of patients that arrived at Memorial Sloan Kettering? And it was every other gene except IDH. That's epistasis, that's classic genetics done in human beings, done in a real disease. And we had a pathway now. And so what, fortunately, Angela Rao out on the West Coast and others figured out that the TET enzymes were demethylases. And we went on to say, gee, the demethylases do a really interesting reaction. They hydroxylate methyl groups on both histones. So there were two families entered into this in TET. It was subsequently found that the Jumanji family histone demethylases does the same enzymology. They take the energetics of converting alpha ketoglutarate to the next product of the TCA cycle, succinate, but not in the TCA cycle, directly as a dioxygenase using molecular oxygen to hydroxylate these methyls. If you do it three times, the methyl falls off as, uh, and, and you've demethylated the substrates. And we now knew that demethylation occurred in the regulation of gene expression, and this 2-HG absolutely blocks the cogs in the wheel of that enzymology because it's a competitive inhibitor and it's 10 millimolar and it's better at binding and inhibiting these whole family of dioxygenases than any other molecule so far that's been found in biology. And so you just lose the ability to demethylate. I think I did this. Leukemia turns out to be a block in the differentiation of the common myeloid progenitor cell. It's just those cells continuing to accumulate and not knowing how to differentiate. And the two most potent things, Ross Levine and others in my lab, made mouse models along with Scott Lowe. Both TET2 and 2HG do exactly that. They block differentiation in vitro models. I'm not going to show you the data. So the commonality is you block differentiation. The rest of the body needs more blood cells. You get all the inductive signals to hematopoiesis. But the cells can't execute on that because all they know how to do is make more progenitors and you suddenly, slowly but surely get leukemia. So the question is, is that any good? At that point, the oncologist said, well, this is all fine. It's laboratory-based stuff. This is classic Gus Watanabe translation. Let's make an inhibitor. We have colleagues at Agios Pharmaceutical. We've made a mouse model that has the two IDH common arginine mutations. And they had found a tool compound that blocked one of them, but not the other. Not great for patients, but really great as a tool, because we had both models of leukemia in the lab, thanks to Scott Lowe. And this is just to demonstrate that. This tool compound blocks the ability of the R140 mutant to make 2-HG, the R172 mutant to make 2-HG. And when paired with a RAS mutation, either one of them, these inexorably got leukemia. That was what we had already been reported with, with Scott. And so we took this drug and we treated the patients. And now patients were, ant were mice. You know, we have a mouse hospital, as we call it, to try these things on. And the, drug, the fellow came in to Scott and I. We were having a meeting. And he said, it, it, wor it made the animals worse. This is horrible. These, these animals have terrible disease. And because he had measured them at one week. And at one week, these animals that should have reacted had a white count that was two and a half times higher. Well, I'm a trained hematologist. So I said, well, OK, let's not panic. Sometimes you get the opposite result of what you think. It's cool, and you learn something in science. It's important not to panic. Let's go look at them under the microscope, not just put them in a cell counter. And this is what the cells are. These are the blasts. And these are the drug-treated cells. They're fully differentiated into macrophages. So, Every cell that was leukemic in these animals over the next three weeks turned into a mature cell and died. Did its rest of its last history. And at three weeks, every one of these animals went into remission. And the other model, where we can't inhibit 2-HG, 
the drug doesn't do anything. It's not toxic, but it doesn't do anything. And that led to the pharmaceutical industry, multiple companies, but Agios was the first into the clinic. They don't actually make these drugs anymore. They sold them to Servier, but they took him into the clinic to say, does this work? And a young fellow in the lab got excited who was doing clinical research. That's why you need a CTSA to get somebody excited to do the clinical trials. And he did a clinical trial. It's the second clinical trial, although the FDA doesn't, well, I can't actually say it failed. The first failed clinical trial led to a drug approval was Gleevec. You probably don't know that story. They started doing the treatment halfway through the dose escalation phase one. Remember, phase one clinical trials are only for the safety of a drug, not its efficacy. The second dose escalation of Gleevec, everybody went into remission. And so they had to go to the FDA and say, what do we do? We don't know what the dose limiting toxicity is, but the people are better. I'm not going to give them more. And the FDA didn't know either because they'd never seen that before. They did 1,500 more people at that dose level in the failed phase one drug study. It never was completed. Those patients are still studied today as part of that phase one study. They have a longer half-life than their AIDS match controls, which are subsequently added at the request of the FDA, but it led to the approval without a completed clinical study. You find a really meaningful drug, it's cool. This is the second one, but the FDA knew about what to do. So they said you have to convert when 40% of the patients at the second dose level went into, or I think it was the third dose level, went into remission, they said, just stick at this dose and see what happens, and we'll call it a phase two study now. But we'll close, because at this dose level, you can report the toxicity. It's really pretty safe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about its black box warning in just a minute. Um, the drug rolled another 126 people. He duplicated the first group, and the drug was approved. 40% of patients went into remission. We don't know whether this is curative because most of those patients were young enough to go on to bone marrow transplantation for their curative therapy because they do much better if they're in remission at the time. So this did lead to meaningful cures, but in combination with the existing therapy, these people that had failed multiple previous therapies. It was transformative is because nobody dies. It's not like when you take a bone marrow for those that are hematology oncology, we take a bone marrow seven weeks into leukemia to see that all the hematopoietic cells are wiped out and the normal cells will come back. This is what it looks like at two weeks. At two weeks, there's tons of cells still, but they're now not blast, they're differentiating cells. And at three, four weeks, the marrow's normalized. Nobody does, they just differentiate. That was observed clinically, the stories have all been written up. Um, the, the overall response was about 40% response, so it's not universal. The first line studies are going on now. I don't know how they're turning out. I'm not involved clinically in that. Uh, but it led to the approval of this drug in, 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 in the recovery arms of leukemia, but it got a black box warning. Now, the company probably wasn't very happy about this, but I can tell you as academics, we loved it. Because the black box warning is, by the way, this causes differentiation. It doesn't kill cells, it causes them to differentiate. I wonder what that means. And it is important, there are side effects to cells coordinately going through your body and dying off and overwhelming the kidney and other organs. Uh, and it has to be managed, but it's a manageable. We know about that in cancer because we give toxic chemotherapeutic agents. So this is a real black box warning. Don't, don't anybody say, I don't think that that's important to pay attention to. But it's because it's on target and on effect. And so that's pretty exciting. The drug by itself doesn't have much toxicity. So this is a really elegant story of the kind of thing that Gus Wabnabi, these rare drugs to hit rare populations, it's precision medicine. It's just another example of the really great stories of precision medicine we've heard from the first examples of Gleevec to the subsequent many drugs that are used in cancer. But this is about precision into population. And one really smart new junior faculty, I told you, Aitenstein said, I really want to affect more people. I don't want people to have leukemia. It's awful to be the head of leukemia. He's now the head of leukemia at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I don't want people to have leukemia. I want them not to have it. And there's a drug. So the most common medical test in the world is, now Sharon answered this question yesterday. She's head of your CTSI. She said it's a creatinine. But that's because she's a nephrologist. <laughs> okay, and that's another story we had a little debate about. It. It's not, she's wrong. <laughs> the most common test worldwide is a CBC. You take a tube of blood, you put it in a machine, a pathologist, like Jay used to have one of the best pathology departments in the world. You have a great one here too, but he wasn't sure here. But, um, and the CBC is done by 8 million people. 
country in the world, every doctor's office has a CBC, access to a CBC machine, right? It's been a revolutionary story of modern medicine. All the anemia is iron deficient anemia. You can't make enough hemoglobin. So you have small red cells and you can pump the machine right away. They can tell you right now. If you have B12 deficiency, you have two bigger red cells because you can't finish cell division, but they kill making a lot of hemoglobin. Two great stories of medicine. This is the explanation of by age groups. This is a review paper on chronic anemias and cytopenias. Not done by us that I just stole to be emblematic of this. So this difference where women get a lot more anemias in their reproductive age is iron deficient anemia, okay? And there are some childhood anemias, which are B12 and other things nutritional. They go away either because they're toxic to young kids or we correct them so that in, you actually see anemia go down for our first five decades of life. And then slowly but surely, starting at age 50, the incidence in both males and females goes progressively up. So by the time you're between 65 and 80, almost 20% of people have an anemia as, or a, a, a cytopenia, a decrease in platelets or a decrease in white blood cells or a decrease in erythrocytes. And it has plagued hematologists for years because we don't know what to do with those people. We know some of them, but not very many of them go on to leukemia. And I think for the cardiologists of the world, this is the most exciting new advance in cardiology because that those people have the remaining risk of heart attacks and cardiovascular disease that are not explained by cholesterol and hypertension and smoking. They explain almost all the residual risk. They've got something wrong. It's called in some places, it's called clonal hematopoiesis. But the seg -seg, at Memorial, we care about it, they're gonna get leukemia. And the majority of the patients don't get leukemia. Um, they have a diagnostic test, their red cells don't get bigger or smaller, they get wider. So the CBC actually reads this out, you just don't know about it because it's one of those nerdy technical details in your CBC and it doesn't get reported on a record. But you can actually identify them from the 8 million people and start a test. So the test that has been going on in hematology for the last couple of years is what genes account for this increase, okay? So it's not one gene like anything else in genetics. Half of these patients will develop mutations in the leukemia causing genes. And those patients are the subgroup that gets leukemia. That's what's shown up in this upper panel here. And the more likely you have a mutation in one of those genes that I sold you in the circuit plot, the more likely you are to progress to leukemia. So if you've got three of them, you're gonna get leukemia. You're in the group that's gonna get leukemia and not cardiovascular disease. If you've got none of them, you're gonna get cardiovascular disease and not leukemia. It's really pretty useful for patient primary care. So that's real population-based, eight million people. You can find out who has it and you can sort them out. And it's 20% of that population as we get older, okay? But can you do anything about it? So if you're in this group where you have a cancer-causing mutation, you can ask what are the mutations? And you can answer what's your likelihood in your lifetime that you're gonna get acute leukemia? And in the next 10 years, this is a French study, if in the next 10 years, if you are in that group, you're gonna get leukemia with 95% certainty in the next 10 years. So you got a clock. This is 20% of the population potentially that you start with. This is one of the major bad outcomes. This is why we're seeing so much older adult leukemia right now. The genes are, that cause the risk, here's, a, here's the risk analysis of the odds ratio. Unfortunately, the one we don't know how to drug is the most common, like it is in many, many cancers, solid, and other P53 loss is the worst, worst odds race are associated, highly statistically significant. But the second one of the genes I just told you about, IDH1 and IDH2. And we got a safe drug for at least the population of IDH2. Nobody does the genetics because nobody knows that you can't treat with P53. So he's at genetics. So Aiton, his colleague um, at uh, WashU said, Huh, well, we get the safe drug. It's never had a safety profile, except causing differentiation, which is actually what we want maybe for these people. So let's organize a clinical trial. They went through a lot of regulatory things. Nobody had ever done a cancer drug for a prevention trial. Um, and they started in the pandemic. Terrible time to start a clinical trial in a pandemic. But we see enough people that are referred at Memorial that have abnormal blood counts and they're worried. New Yorkers worry about everything, so they worry about this. Um, and they do it in St. Louis too. Um, it's a lot to this pilot study. And this data is all a year old. I didn't realize until I understood what the theme of the meeting was, I wasn't gonna tell you the story, it's ongoing. Um, and so this is 
So what I've been told by the group is that since this is a, um, everybody knows they're getting the drug, it's remarkable. Almost all the patients have their cytopenia corrected. We do not know because it takes a long time to figure out if it's a 10 year leukemia risk, has any impact on that. And we don't really know whether that cytopenia correction causes disease, it prevents disease like infection. But here's the very first patient that was dosed a couple of years ago and is still on the drug and still having a positive response. I hear from Aiden, the last time I talked to him was about four or five months ago, I'm not involved in the trial. He gave me this slide. This is the very first patient enrolled in this trial. They have granulocytopenia that was chronic and it had been followed for over a year. It was referral to Memorial Sloan Kettering with a low ANC, so that's really to monitor a high infection risk. And so they were referred, well, is there anything we can do about it? They were, he, the person agreed to enroll in this trial, uh, and this is the first day they got the drug. And this is the correction is white count. I am told, I have not seen the data, that this patient continues to have a corrected white count. He knows he feels better. Uh, Non-disclosure, I don't know who it is, but apparently it's a male. Um, and, this is an ongoing study of prevention. This is one of the most common things that brings people in aging to the primary care doctor. Are somebody getting a CBC, not feeling well, going to a doctor and saying, can I do anything about it? So we'll see. It will not treat everybody that has that, but the people who have IDH2 mutation. We ever get a P53, that's well, hopefully it'll be done. This is purely investigational. We would like more centers to do this. You have an eight amazing medical schools. You could do this at the CTSI, but you'd have to talk to eight or his colleagues about this. Um, but it's really exciting for us to now start to see prevention therapies start to move into population by research because that's how we deliver to the public and get them excited with science again. I apologize for going on so long. I've cut in five minutes into your break. Um, this was really wasn't set up to have a lot of questions and answers. I'll be here throughout the day listening to the exciting talks. And I really appreciate the honor of receiving this award from Dr. It was named for Dr. Watanabe. And I hope we've done just a little bit to excite you about why we all come together as academic medical centers to do translational research. And I just shared one of the many great stories that have come out of the last couple of decades. Uh, so thank you for your time and I look forward to the rest of the day. Despite your offer to let us go get coffee, that was a really great talk um, and just raises a number of potential questions and insights. I just wanted to offer if there were a couple questions, we'll, we'll hold our coffee. It'll stay warm just for if, if people have a couple questions. I wanted to give that opportunity. I, while Jay's getting up, I do want to mention one person who's laughing out in the back corner as you made those comments. Louise Carlson was my first technician. She and I formed a new lab in 1987. She was brave enough to move from Seattle to Ann Arbor, Michigan with me because she's an adventurer. She has the best hands in science I have ever worked with. I'm pretty good at starting experiments, but she's the person that finished every experiment we did in the first 10 years in my lab. Um, I promised I would never speak to Kelvin again when he left the lab because he not only left the lab to go on to the career that he has and be cancer center director, he took Louise with him and they got married. They have two wonderful kids. Um, and Louise has never once thought come back and work on this great team we had. But uh, it's really an honor for me that she's back in the audience, a member of the, of the staff here at, at IU. And uh, Louise, thank you for being here and for everything. Craig, that was an incredible talk. Um, we had an interesting conversation last night about how, you know, science is difficult and it would appear, you know, that um, some people just seem, everything seems to work and all, but uh, can we talk just a little bit about how do you have a career in science? Uh, inevitably, there'll be times when things aren't working or it's very discouraging. Uh, any, any insights for, for all of us about how you, how you get through those times? So I probably left some names off, but we're all in this together. And sometimes medical centers think they compete with each other. We don't, we're all involved in that together. 
And sometimes your research doesn't work, but I have a core of colleagues that started when I was in medical school and then in a resident and fellow. And they're the people I draw on. They're the people that I mentioned in this talk. Nobody does this. I cherry picked some stuff to tell you that it's been an incredibly exciting journey to be part of this and follow on the, the leaders like Dr. Watanabe who thought about these ideas in a modern sense with molecular biology. But um, uh, what matters is to remember, okay, that you didn't cause these diseases, but we need to understand their scientific underpinnings and see how to find rational ways to understand that. So sometimes you're only frustrated because you discover some of the pathogenesis with no way to intervene with that. And that seems like esoterica to the public. And that's why we need translation research. And ultimately our goal is to prevent it. And that's what we're gonna spend the rest of the day on is how do we get in for the population? How do we make it more equitable? The biggest thing for bone marrow transplantation, as I told you, is cord blood transport. Everybody can have a donor if that's where they're backed into for their therapy. We don't want anybody to get there though, so we'd like to think about therapies in advance. And so the great thing about a medical education is they teach me how to juggle a lot of problems. Um, I had a lot of patients. They all had different problems. We, we take the lab the same way. We have multiple projects. They're great training projects for students that are in the lab, for undergraduate students to come learn how exciting science is. And so all those other times we're training people, we're training people. Um, I get criticized a lot for things I didn't follow up on. That's not, I like to think that's not my fault. Maybe it's an excuse, but I've had great fellows like Kelvin that go off and work on that problem. And then we don't compete with the, our trainees. They're smarter and better. They're the ones that did the work. And that's fantastic. And it's refilling even when nothing's working in the lab. So you can keep doing stuff. And it is great to see and visit universities like the and see people who are your colleagues and done things and how they're progressing. Um, Larry, I, Larry, I don't think is here. I haven't seen him. Come on, he's somebody like that who made IU in oncology a hopeful place. He cured men with testicular cancer. That's amazing. So we, you got to draw on your field just as much as your own lab and know you're participating. Sometimes you get the negative studies, so you tell others that's not the way to go. Sometimes you get lucky and you get positive. We're like baseball players. I know Shatel Hadani just had a record baseball game for the, for the ages yesterday, but in reality, most people that can bat over 250 are professional ball players. And that's one in four times you're successful at your job. Thank you. That was a fascinating talk, and thanks for making it for a non immunologist to be able to understand, at least in the, in the first part. Um, so <laughs> that, uh, well, I mean, yeah, we're really yeah, good at immunity. Uh, this is true of all medicine. It's just whoever says it, right? It's right, in their yeah. field. But okay, go ahead. Okay. So the rest of the metabolism was that. The, the one of the things that's puzzled me about the immuno oncology drugs, uh, and this might be because I'm not an immunologist, but you know, like Pembro and those that the cutoff for response is like 10 megabases or 10 mutations per megabase. So right. when you figure across the whole genome, that's a lot of mutations. Why right. isn't it that just a few mutations would be sufficient to amount an immune response, do you think? Why does it take so many when, you know, a very, typically, I think, uh, a very small difference in a protein can mount an immune response? That is a really critical question. And our views to answer that, if I'd answered it four years ago, I'd have given you a different answer. The answer right now is we really don't know. And so our explanation to avoid working on that problem was that in fact, RNA vaccines didn't work, but turns out they do. Right, COVID has been revolutionized by an RNA vaccine. There aren't that many epitopes in it and it still works. So we don't know the answer to that. And it probably means not every mutation can be recognized and you just need enough of them. So there's a chance one will be recognized. And so the on switch is already there and you just have to take off as Jim Allison says, the break. That's the best explanation right now, but it isn't the one I would have given you two years ago, which means we really don't know. But it's a great question. So again, there's things to learn. So students and postdocs, we haven't figured it out. I told you a great story. It sounds like, wow, there's cool stuff, but there's lots of questions that should be asked. That's why I don't want any questions and answers. It'll just defeat the story. But anyway. Thank you so much. I think we're gonna take our break. Yeah, but everybody just go get again, some coffee, then go hear the great speakers talk. afterwards. Thank you.